Hey, what's up? This is Chuck D, Public Enemy, and also Prophets of Rage. You are tuned into the Great Song Adventure. <laughs> Zolo, bring the noise. Everything in the past has to be processed for the present and the future. And I mean, I'm talking about creations, because past is past. But our key to our futures and our present is taking those things and honoring them, honoring them and revering them and holding them in some kind of, you know, currency that fuels us. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important, and I and that's I think that's overlooked a lot of times when it comes down to culture. Uh, we're living in a sports late sports laden nation mm-hmm. where everything is sports, 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 sport, and they uphold sports at all costs. And high schools are laden with sports, and colleges are fueled by sports and the fanaticism. But the arts has suffered, and I don't think the arts should be a notch under sports. And the education yes. about sports is high. And yes. somebody who's educated might go into being a lawyer in the sports world instead of being a lawyer in social justice and things like that. Um, and so I just feel that is is a time to 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 try to upgrade, repair, and honor the curation of the arts. Yeah. And you mean all arts by that? The, yeah. Yeah. All arts. Yeah. I mean, in other countries, as you know, they honor the arts as part of, you know, what's important. The government has art, cultural art. But in America, we kind of expect the artists to do it for themselves, pretty much. The earth without art is just eh. And I don't mean to be Canadian on it. (laughs) Yeah. But it's just like, you know, art is like, art is everything that probably isn't God created, no matter what kind of God you believe in. But everything else has to be kind of like looked upon into some kind of scrawling design to end up being something. From the clothes we wear, the houses we live in, to the lawns we might want to see cut. And, and you know, art is, is really ser- seriously the essence of a lot of beginning. And self-expression and being able to have a unique voice. What I love about nature is it's not perfect. Nothing looks the same. And, right. and as human beings... Our cultures want to pour us into structures where we can buy something. Right. Consumption is a, is a byproduct of, of people who are, are not encouraged to be creative. I, I'm a firm believer that, that, that we have to kind of like teach people to be creative, to get more, so a person can get more out of themselves. Mm-hmm as opposed to clamoring to buy something to, mm-hmm. to, to get satisfied. Mm-hmm. And I think the satisfaction is deep within. And everybody has art within them. Whether it can come out, is, a, is I think, is the job. And I need, that needs to be encouraged because I think there's a, a, lot, a lot of self-satisfaction in it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I think, just the natural drug. I, mean, I grew up with a music class and a music teacher that encouraged me to write songs. Right. That was so important. Without right. that, it would have been a different life. And you, you would think America, being in a, a, a brave new country, would know that. Right. Well, you would think America, a brave new country, <laughs> would also in, uh, uh, encourage other languages, too, but it doesn't. Yeah. Your, your record, by the way, I'm not going to get all fangirl on you. That's but, all right. <laughs> but I, I love... I love your record. What the latest one? Uh, the, the the Mr. Chuck. Oh yeah, the, the, the celebration, celebration of ignorance. ignorance. Yeah. Uh, At, lyrically, every song and and the colors and the the, the textures and the, the lyrics, yeah. the subject matter, the delivery. I, I just love it from top to bottom. Yeah, I, I, you know the thing is, I've never done anything by myself, and that, that's the great part about 
doing music and writing songs. I've never written a song by myself. Well, I've never written a record by myself. This is myself. the first time? Everything has always been a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Whether I've written a song, um, I've never done music. I, I've done music, I, I guess. But everything is a team effort. So mm -hmm. uh, David C. Knox Snyder is my record label partner. He's a collaborator for many years. And now he's really stepped up into the music making aspect of it for the last five years. And he's really, I mean, a great songwriting partner from the music side. And also lyrically, um, Tormund Jahi, who's a um, project experience millennium. And also he had joined me. We've been recording together off and on. I've been helping his projects. And uh, he's also another vocalist on the record. And we had just gotten back off a tour of um, of 13 countries and, and, and seeing some of that work to fruition on stage. So Jahi, working with him vocally um, and also working with C-Doc musically is really the core of my label and we had a great time making it, great time performing it. And um, I'm really appreciative of your, of your words on it uh, because, I mean, that's what we set out to do. We come from a stock that revere, you know, songwriters such as, you know, your family. And it, and it all counts. And as you saw my book collection, and, and although I don't collect too many songs because they're in the now defunct iTunes <laughs> yes. <laughs> as of yesterday, right? Yeah. But, um, but all the songs are there, and the songs are not just to be heard, but listened to. Mm. You know, every word, word words count. Yeah, I looked at some of the CDs. You got Willie Nelson over there, and interesting. Uh, uh, Gordon Lightfoot it was even there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, that's that. It's not even symbolic of what I. All my stuff is in iTunes, and if I have CDs, if I go to a spot and I see something for three dollars, I said, "No, nah, this is a shame. I need to hold it up." <laughs> I'm, I'm by the best of the Delphonics too. Right, right. <laughs> you know, it's, um, so I, it, it's. It's really like it, it's symbolic of what I listen to, but it's it's not really. I don't you know I don't hardly play it. I play it from my my iPod and mm -hmm. and stream. What, what yeah and I'm not not really stream. I'm not really the stream guy. I got we have the rap stations and the networks where we have ten station channels that curate and break down rap music and hip hop to the to the um, to the infinite finest. That's my extent of streams to contribute to the streams. But when I listen to when I listen to music, I do listen to streamed radio in the form of Sirius XM. I have a hard time leaving the 60s and the 70s. I don't really listen to music from the 80s and the 90s. And um, and sometimes I, my exploration is, is digging me further into the 50s. So what Sirius does as far as a job on um, 50s and it's actually 60s and 70s, which I don't leave 60s on 6 and 70s on 7, and uh, what they do in volume. And this is not a serious XM commercial, but I'm telling you what I listen to, if it's stream, it's gonna be through that satellite like me um, format. And then also I'm gonna play the music myself or do a shuffle system of my 58,000 songs. <laughs> you can't beat, hey look, you can't beat having songs in the palm of your hand and, and playing them back. I mean, when I was a kid, yeah. You know, if I had a song, it would stay in my head, and I couldn't get to that song, mm -hmm. but right. it would stay in my head. Now the fact that if it's in my head, I'm going to try to get to that song. So those are that's one of the advantages that technology and the beauty that technology has given us, that we can visit the song when it pops up in our head. Mm -hmm. sure can. We can get it quick, too. We can get it quick. And, and, and not to be that we're... Uh, convenient to the moment, you know, like uh, that, because that's a consumer. A consumer sometimes is like a tourist. But I, I just think that, you know, th th it feels good to get to the actual song when it's in your head, because it makes you get to more songs. Yeah. And I do believe that songs should be sipped like fine wine and not guzzled. Ah. Mm -hmm. Not guzzled like a 40, like we say in the hood. <laughs> yeah. Right, because a good song is like a fine wine. You could, you could it ages, it, it lasts, it gets better. It time. gives you yeah. fuel for your day. Yeah. I mean, after a while, talk gets to a point where it's just talk and it could drown you out, so music could set you free. And um, this week has been, you know, like, you know, you hear talk, you turn on news, and after a while, you know, you have sports everywhere. After a while, you say, you know what, the only thing I want to hear is either silence or music. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. 
Now you, you you were born in 1960. Yes. So what were you listening to when you when you were growing up? Was it mostly radio? Were you getting 45s as well? Or? I was telling Louise right here, like a, a parents of like a parents, both of them were like aunts and uncles. See, most musicians in the 60s and the 70s, the fact that they were played in your household, well, they were like family members because everything was conducive to listening to as a kid. And you never you never got the double entendre anyway. You but that was cool. That's why it was there as double entendre. So from the Stevie Wonders, the Aretha Franklins, you know, the Three Dog Knights, to, to you know, the Carol King and Jerry Goffins, all those songs, you know, Lil' Eva, I remember like hearing that, and, you know, locomotive about three years old. So yeah. these things are played in the house. My parents were young parents in the sixties and the seventies. And so therefore they was hip with the sixties and the seventies. They didn't bring the fifties into the sixties. <laughs> they were sixties bringing the sixties into the seventies. And that, that was, you know, from 60 to 1978, I'm zero to 18. So you go figure the music in that period from 1960 to 1978 yeah. is the best of all time. And there will never ever be a time that will orally be superior to that period of time. I'm sorry. And like, things today are different because they're more multidimensional. Like music today is four areas. It's sight, sound, story, and the style. Now, sight is your visual aspect of it. Your style is like, what does this artist have? This could be the stuff they call branding and marketing. And the story, what is this artist and what is this song about? You know, so music is four areas. Before it was just one area. It's like what you heard is mm -hmm. what you got, and then you had to have your imagination flick on. So my imagination ran deep of listening to the music in the 60s and the 70s. And it wasn't like I wanted to become a musician anyway. I didn't want to become a singer. I couldn't sing. I wanted to become a sports announcer. And sports is what I was into. And so therefore, rap came along and it had a combination of a bunch of different things. And I happened to be at the right place at the right time, at the right age, at the cusp of the, of the 80s. I read you said once that you started rapping because you'd be at parties and the other guys rapping were, were not good. They sucked. And you wanted to get a better message and a better rap across. Yeah, well, some things that you have to also pay attention to is what you're God-given. And I, I had a God-given loud, solid voice that is probably just genetics. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are you going to do with it? You know, and then, okay, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Maybe I'd be a sports announcer. Maybe I'd be a person, you know, everything except for auctioneer, right? <laughs> but I, that's the same, you know, so when I would hear guys like Marv Albert, who's a New York Knicks announcer. Yeah, I heard he was one of your big influences, Marv yeah, Albert. Yeah. I didn't, yeah, because I wanted to broadcast like him. He had a speed. And not so much how Marv Albert covered basketball, which he's known for. Mm -hmm. But being a New Yorker, he, he covered the Jets and football. And he really covered the Rangers. So to hear Marv Albert do play-by-play -play on hockey, is it was a, it's like he was like he was speed rapping. Hmm. Because the game is fast. And his description on the ice was just unreal. So... Back in the day, Marv Albert did play-by-play -play for the Rangers game and the Knicks on WNBC. And But his Ranger play-by-play -play is uh, was unparalleled. Wow. So you everything that happened in your life came together to just right. bring you to what you do for a living. Right, because um, I'm a firm believer that you write half a life and the other half of life writes it for you. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? The other mm -hmm. half of life writes itself. It's a conversation. It's a conversation. They so said you, you, it's a dance. Yeah. You weren't musical, but you definitely have rhythm. And when I hear you rap, you've got the groove, you've got soul. Was, was that there in you, or did you develop that? Well, I grew up in a Motown, Stax, Atlantic household. With my dad dabbled in a little bit of jazz because he was part of the Columbia Record Club. Ah, so just, that's, what it, that's where the records came through. Not that he listened to them, but, you know, you would see the jackets and... And the, the records rec had pocket. The drumming was great. And right. Yeah. And, and the thing about it, the records came to the house, mail delivered. I remember those. Yeah. Yeah. Those you know. Clubs, yeah. And, 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 and you know, and the, and, the, and 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 the um the ads and the magazines were just you know, they were just like trick to people like hey you know, eleven cents you get <laughs> you get a box of records. I did that in the seventies as a teenager. I did try to. The record club? Yeah, I yeah, tried a record too. club. Yeah. ZZ Top was the first record that came. <laughs> Do you feel like record clubs 
should be a way to reestablish record labels in the streaming world? Actually, I think vinyl record clubs now would be a great thing. There you go. It would be a great thing. And if you start one, let me know, because I'll, yeah. join, I'll join up. But, but would you give the vinyl back or you hold on to it? Is it something where it's circular? Like, I don't know. But yeah. all I know is that at the Spit Slam Record <laughs> Label Group, yeah. we, the Spit Slam Record Label Group is my label, and we have artists such as um, PE 2.0, which is Project Experience Millennium, we have, we're releasing a jazz album on a, on a college classmate of mine. Her name is Alicia Crow, mm -hmm. and she's doing the song. She, we, she already recorded it at the Idrium in the city, in New York City, and um, she's doing the songs of Alberta Hunter. Oh, cool. So, and, and we have a, you know, a, of course it's a hip-hop label, but we curate music. Mm. And uh, we have an artist who does kind of like radical country folk from Hamilton, Ontario, and her name is Anna Mae Oskin. So I was just trying to get her in places. Um, it's not really based on what the artist sells. It's based on what it is and can we get it in some nice places. So from Anime Oskin, Chris Payne is just a torrid, straight-up rapper born on the same birth date I have, who's from my same hometown. So Chris Payne, is he's rough. When we have a, an artist who, who's a boss of K-Hop, which is Korean hip-hop, and his name is Sammy Sam. And uh, so, you know, we try, we do a lot of different diverse things and we have a ball at it. So one of the main features is making great vinyl and making cassettes and having a ball at pretending that we're a record label and having a ball <laughs> at pretending that we're a radio super network. Because <laughs> we, we enjoy the tools We can out learn there. a bit from that. Yeah, yeah. that sounds great. Because as you know, artist development used to yeah. be something record companies do. They would help the artist develop. And, right. And, and grow. And that's a beautiful do that. thing. That's just what that's what we do to have fun. Yeah, it's yeah. all about having fun, really. And, and, and not spending a lot of money doing the, having fun because you can, you can lose a lot. So you want to make sure that the right thing right time, right place, right space, and hopefully maybe it can pay for itself. Or have but, a job on the side. Uh, no, have a job. Have a job primarily. We tell people, <laughs> yeah, have a job up top. We tell people. Hear like, that, kids? Have a job. Get a job. working class people that are able yeah. to find time, you know, outside their duties, outside their job and their families to say, hey, you know, I'm a recording artist with the Spit Slam record label group, and I'm heard on Rap Station, you mm -hmm. know, the world's loudest radio internet. So we kind of I, I tell people have fun at it we're, we're like we're, we're paying we're playing make-believe radio station make-believe record company and some things that pop out of it end up being reality yeah <laughs> that's pretty real if you're making records and get, getting them heard that's real right? it's yeah. like a there's a kid's book called stone soup a story about how there's no food and right. someone comes into town and said I'm making some soup here. Bring me some. What have you got? And he's got stones. Just right. and then people start bringing carrots. Right. And, they start, and before you uh, know it, there's, the he's feeding everybody in the town the stone soup. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. But given that, are you deluged with a million artists trying to get to you? So you'll. I'm encouraged by it because I'm a sports fan. If a million people buy, you know, footwear that doesn't distract from the NBA or Major League Baseball. But do you have time to go through the, all the music that's coming to you and um, deal with all well, that? Well, one, one, one advantage that we have is that we're micro-niched into a genre which is unorganized, so it's not like I'm it's like every bass player that comes through or every rock band or an opera singer. No, we, we're, we're at Rap Station, we say, you know, this is rap and hip-hop. And because it's narrow into a niche, it allows us to go at something that's small but yet big. Mm. That makes sense, and that's that's smart. Uh, speaking of sports, I, I wanted to ask you about. You sound like Howard Cosell. Speaking of sports. Speaking of sports. <laughs> it's just like I grew up as a WABC fan, so that's that's where a lot of this comes from. That goes back to the answer, of 1960 to 1978. That's WABC, man. Really, the, the strongest period of music to me is 64 to 74. I was WABC. AM, that's an AM station. 77, WABC. I remember that. Yeah, I go to YouTube and listen to it all the time. <laughs> that's fun. I was just asking about Tired of 45, the LeBron James comparison to Trump, and that I was wanting to know about the the first one has a date of 1984, right. and the last one has a date of, of 2018. Yeah. So 
I know you didn't write about Trump in 1984. No, but you know what? I could have. Mm -hmm. You know, at that same time, he was the dude that actually, you know, vilified the Central Park Five and, and, and didn't give the story a chance to, to come out in any truth, and he put out an ad in the New York Post. And this dude was also the owner of the New York Generals, the USFL football team at the time, mm-hmm. Tr- Donald Trump. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I'm an old New York head that just, I haven't seen the dude's game. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, from the Trump casinos to the, to the real estate going on or whatever. But here, this guy now has real generals under his thumb. Mm-hmm. So there's, no, there's no USFL New York Generals football team. It's a it's the United States of America Generals as the commander in chief. That's scary. Um, but the mm-hmm. what, entire of forty five, those dates just signify the style of rap. Music. Got it. Because um, the other one was um, um, LeBron James' birth date. Um, that that was that's yeah. his birthday. Yeah, it's his birthday, nineteen eighty five, which was the style of hip hop at the particular time. I'm going to tell you the rabbit hole I went down for okay. research. <laughs> tell us I how went forty five. Okay. I'm going to look up what basketball players have had the number forty five <laughs> and see if there's that's Michael the, Jordan had a had a forty five that he probably regrets. You know, back when he came back. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was good a, guess. Yeah. Good guess, but no, no, it's like. The, the, the 85 was the style of hip-hop at the particular time. It was more Run DMC style, mm-hmm. which, which we loved. And C-Doc, David Snyder, created a track and a type of mode that t- took myself and Jahi into. And we made a modern version, of course, which was more like trap. You know, it was more trapped by a, a creator by the name of Von K. So. And what date is that? Is that someone's birthday too? That was up. No, nah, it was pretty much like update. Um, the date of the the track. Date of the track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. You know, when you said you could have written the Trump song a long time ago, you did write "Tear Down the Wall" in 2010, which is a great yeah. record. Yeah, tear down. And the that's wall. about now better probably than and it's like the best Trump song he wrote it six years before he was elected I hey think. we're not supposed to say his name right yeah, that's we're it. not even yeah, supposed okay. to say well, you guys got a beep like beep <laughs> beep <laughs> but um yeah I wrote down tear down the wall especially it was my first kind of time moving in California and I saw just like the one sided treatment of well I, I've seen it way before then but I wanted to address it because just the one sided treatment of of especially Latino people, and I'm just like saying, it's like, come on, man, borders to keep to keep human beings from seeing the planet. You know, government split humans up into categories, put them in these little boxes, stick flags on top of them. Mm-hmm. Culture spreads us out, makes mm-hmm. us look at the human spirit on the planet Earth, breaks down our you know differences, lines up our similarities. That's why you want culture and art to be taught. It's the essence of who we are as human beings and why we have this planet. It's the only one world. Ain't nobody leaving the planet and coming back on the bus. So, you know, it's, you know, yes, people are in and out. They, they, they live and they die. But while you're here, you know, understand that, you know, the human spirit could do its best to hold itself together and hold this place together. Yes. And it, it was amazing and prophetic to me that you you grasped the symbolism of the wall, mm-hmm. which he then used in the opposite way, that the wall is good to divide us. You were saying tear down the wall before he was even talking about building one. I mean, yeah. after all, this was all Mexico originally, where we're sitting right now. I mean, really, uh, I can get into just this, this whole hippie vibe, which I am truly, I believe, you know, if you're a songwriter, you're automatically in the hippie vibe. <laughs> That's where we come from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um... You know, I, I, the wax poetic about that is just like a, it's an overstood, you know, statement to say that this is only one world, and we shouldn't be alien to the one planet because governments, you know, who are proven to be the cancer of civilizations, you know, governments just want to come with their borders, orders beside the waters. You know, you know, you're gonna run the air and the water, and it's like, all right. If it's to keep people in check from being overzealous and greedy, cool. But it hasn't proven to been that historically. So it's always something to work on. And music can, can do its best to try to take down those barriers and those walls. The words could take the, the place of, you know, living beings that take down these differences. Mm-hmm. Words. Yeah. You have a whole song, Freed Black, is all about 
writing and yeah, music. Yeah, being free to, you know, this, the, you know, being a free black, no chains on me. And, and, you know, it was a play on feedback, you know. No, nah, I'm, yeah, okay, the feedback is going to come from a free black. I, I love the lyrics and you talk about you don't have time for mumbling. I mean, th there is a lot of bad rap happening now. I don't even feel like the term rap should be used for it seems more like a consumer record company idea of what rap music is and it's it's not about saying something it's more about this these ideas of what power is yeah it's all it's almost like the boardroom gone gone bad <laughs> and it's not necessarily the record company boardrooms because you can't recognize the record companies like you used to but the authoritative positions of selection are still in place. Like, well, okay, you know, your song is going to be streamed on this outlet, and there's, this song is being chosen to be licensed in this area. So there's a lot of areas that the powers that be are still in high management positions to anoint something to be that and something to not be that. But, you know, I ignore all that. You know, I'm like... I'm like tell artists. I say you got to just be you, and once you start getting into the area of bean counting, you think that's outside your lane. Right. So that's the 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 beauty about being an artist is that you can go about saying what you feel, but also being what you know, say what you feel, but really being who you are. So a lot of times you want to say what you feel, but you know, really seriously, did that feel good saying that? Are you really that person that feels good saying that even if you think you're right? So I think you have to be sensitive to who you're talking to, just like in a conversation. Mm -hmm. Because you think it doesn't mean you automatically say it. You know, you're an owner to what you don't say, but you're a slave to what you do say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well put. So, it's good you know. With words, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know, you, this guy, I mean, I mean, I, I could look when I was 25 and 26 and read interviews that I did when I was 25, 26, and 27. And I could be honest and say, well, damn. I was out of my goddamn mind, <laughs> but but I, but also you're being honest to say I didn't have the language to say what I really want to say here, and there ain't too many blots on my conversations, my interviews, but there are some things that I'd be like, oh, you know, damn, that sounds just like somebody who did not have the words to convey what he meant. You know, I, I listened to or read many of your interviews recently, and I was kind of amazed by how restrained you were when sometimes people would ask you kind of uninformed, maybe even stupid questions mm -hmm. about white versus black and how they framed it. And you patiently kind of explain, no, you're coming from a different context. This is the reality of where our frame of context. And I was, I was really impressed by how you basically everything they were saying was false. Mm -hmm. I mean, several people said, you know, isn't it your job to unite us, you know, to bring the whites and the blacks together? And instead you're dividing us. And you were saying, you know, we have to it's not our job to do that. We have to express what we've gone through. And the reality of being a black in America is a, it is a whole different reality. Yeah, well, the reality of being black in the United States of America, and the reason I don't just say America, because you got to include North and South and Central America, and the Caribbean, where there's been always, you know, uckery going on. <laughs> so, you know, you, you get into the thing, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of growing up in a, in a you know, in the neighborhood and I'm grown in a neighborhood and I'm grandfathering in a neighborhood where my grandchildren have to kind of like see the world scope of who they are, know who they are, and then come up with that language, hopefully at a time that makes them get through their life and not be burdened by it. You know, they have an understanding. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding doesn't come in a microwave. Um, obviously, if I'm going to be near 60 years old, I got to be able to come up with a language to make a 20-year-old not feel defeated, but feel like they're clear. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to, you know, I, I got to also be overstanding to the emotions that they might have, but also I got to be able to give them some clarity. And I really got to be, you got to be a songwriter being a parent or a grandparent or older person because you got to truncate and reduce Whatever that emotion is that they got that they can't break down into three words, and you could give it to them in three words. My father was great at that. You know, hey, I come with this narrative, you know, like what I think, and he'd say it in three words, and it's like, oh, okay, I, I got it, <laughs> you know? And and that's that comes with, it comes really with more listening than talking. And I think that's one, what people don't know about me. I'm more of a listener than a talker. 
Now, when you hear me, of course, I'm going to say what I have to say, and, and I have enough tenure behind me to, to say what I say and mean. And also, I could draw to it quick. I could go to it quick, and I can, you know, relish upon it and, and dish it out. But that comes with, you know, having a, a, a command of yourself and your language and knowing who you're speaking to and knowing who might not like what you're saying on the other end. It doesn't make you soft. It makes it like I'm putting it out there and I'm putting it out there like this. And even if you have a difficulty with me delivering it like that, when you look into it, you'll see that, okay, this is what I'm trying to tell you. What you don't know, take it, you know, and 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 take a look at it from a different type of way if you choose to. So I just think that that comes, that comes in time. But, you know, like I think songwriters and songwriting tells you how to get it out quick, to the point, and don't waste time meandering all around the bush. Mm. I agree, and I also feel that the song is, is, is a little bit like church, where it requires you to be humble to what the song wants from you. Yeah. It's not about what I want to say. It's about I'm going through this thing and I'm coming to terms with this lesson and I want to convey this lesson in a way that I'm learning it at the same time. Yeah. And then you listen back and you realize I'm smarter than I was before I wrote this song. Exactly. Or I'm smarter than I was before I heard the song. Yeah, and that would be... You know, Good for the listener. And, and this is where a lot of people, they don't understand that the education of music is so important. And we get it as an, edu as an education system in the wee early age, the kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. There's a lot of harmony and melody and songs and words and muscle memory going on. But that dissipates after seventh, eighth, ninth grade when pretty much everything is left up to corporations and turning kids into consumers. Yeah. yeah. When you're young enough, you can be playful and enjoy art and draw, but you're, they get rid of those childish things pretty early right. as if art is childish. And then what, then, then what they teach you from like grade seven on up to, to 12, a lot of those things that I wouldn't say it's a waste of time. You got to see, I believe maybe you have to go through 15 grades. <laughs> Meaning that you got to learn all the BS. I mean, as a black man in this society, I tell people well, there's a lot of non-factual BS that you we have to know in order to know how the truth is. So you got to know the contrast, and and the contrast is like when you see the truth, you know that the lies are totally illogical. Mm. But if you're told the lies and told to believe the lies, and you're going just like oh, oh you know, and then you're going to venture off on trying to discover whether it's a lie or not. Do you mean the lies that we taught in our history about the lie, the well, could, history? Well, or, or the short the, sh, uh, the short stanzas of the history or, or the one-sidedness of the history. Yeah, we grew up celebrating Columbus Day. Yeah, They're yeah. getting rid of that, but that, when you yeah. think about that, we were doing that. Exactly. There's a, there's a lot of that go that goes on. So you got to kind of learn that. Or even the Confederate statues. People don't want to pull down those statues and we got to save that. You sort of got to learn that, and then the rest of your education is to be able to, to clarify and take half of it down. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Because if you say, all right, listen, this is how it is, and we're going to teach everybody, then that's going to be looked upon with doubt, too, mm -hmm. and scrutiny, and, and the truth for who. So you kind of kind of got to learn it all. Do we have the, the bandwidth and the brain width in the society to learn everything and then try to disseminate what's true and false afterwards? But you got to kind of do that in life anyway. Well, history is written by the victors, you know. That, that's always been the thing. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's really instructive that you, you've said that in other interviews that you listen more than you talk. And yeah. to be a good writer, you do have to listen. And a lot of people don't want to listen to others. They think they already know everything. And even if you're hearing someone that's not intelligent, you, you learn from everyone that you listen to. Yeah? Well, we come from a time where in the 60s and the 70s, you, you had to listen to the words. Mm -hmm. Listen to the lyrics, man. The lyrics have set you free, man. Yeah. You know, the lyrics the lyrics of the 60s and the 70s. And then rap, when rap first started as a recorded medium, understand the Grandmaster Flashes and the Furious Five, the Cool Modis and the Treacherous Three, the Run DMCs, the Houdinis. You know, these artists were inspired, Salt and Pepper, these artists were inspired by the music of the 70s and the 60s. 
you know, they were inspired by that. You know, Bismarck and KRS One would give references. Uh, you know, um, Just Ice, I'm leaving. He puts in his lyrics. You know, on a jet plane, which is Peter Paul and Mary. <laughs> you know, <laughs> KRS One is like. Of, you know, I mean, Slick Rick that does me shell my bells is like goes off the Beatles, and then um, Karis One, you know, with with still rock and roll to me, and still hip hop to me, it was off of Billy Joel. So, a lot of the references of hip hop in the eighties was off the heels of the great works that were done in the seventies and the sixties. Yeah. It's interesting when you were. Reading your interviews, you're you stressing that uh, to be a good songwriter, you need content. The song needs to be about something. And I realized in pop songs, if you've got a great melody, you can get away with less content. you got a killer melody, might be pretty good. But in rap, you, it's all about the words. And yours especially was all about the message and the, the knowledge you were imparting as well. Well, rap is, is went on a, on a bunch of different tangent points where, you know, you can play around with, you can play around with, you know, sense of melody. Mm-hmm. Uh, rap's strong point is that with your words, you can play around with a sense of melody and a sense of reminder. It could you could come up with something that reminds you of something hmm. without actually taking and drawing from it fully. Mm-hmm. And it comes across like what they, you remember CNN used to have headline news. Mm-hmm. You know, not everything's a headline. It's called Twitter. But in, um, <laughs> yeah. But I'm saying that you you could come up with a sense of reminder, just like I like I said with those. Rap records, you know, Karis One, who's not going to be a singer, could go up and say, still hip hop to me. And somebody would be like, wow, that's Billy Joel. So that's often overlooked. Mm-hmm. Usually the problem that we had in rap music and hip hop is that there hadn't been enough solid statesmen of authors and journalists that could go to the detail and the crux of the art form that we've needed. This is one of the reasons why possibly, you know, Eric B. and Rakim and Karis Wan and um, and most importantly, LL Cool J is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's the, the body of journalists and, and forensic um, teachings, teachers are not there as far as the voting um, cast yet. It's, they might say they love rap, like rap and all, but they're still kind of like on the outsiders of its understanding to the detail. Not understanding what it is. It, it, people go and say, I don't understand hip-hop. Yeah, they can't make comparisons. Like yeah. me, I'm, I'm a student of, of, of the art forms, and um, I can make a comparison and say, well, I think LL Cool J should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because he's our little Richard. And that he would he would have been and he should have been the first soloist to have been inducted, but then you have people who are kind of like out of enthusiasts that would point to the marketing of a Tupac and say, well, post um, posthumously, Tupac was the first selection in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to be um, voted in. As, and the first one as a soloist. And I just thought that was the wrong move. You don't blame the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you blame the body of voters who actually would vote that in because you gotta have a logical vote in there. Um, the first selections into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame happen to be groups. Uh, Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five. And then, you know, you had um, Run DMC. Then you had the Beastie Boys and then Public Enemy. And we under, we understand that groups, and this has also been a shortfall for hip hop and rap too, because I believe that groups not only are panoramic live, they give a bunch of different aspects, and they make the sight, style, story, and sound even go to greater heights, and also lower depths too. But I'm just saying that they couldn't see how a one person could get in there from a rap and hip hop standpoint. They will later on. We yeah. come down to Eminem and Jay Z and even Tupac. They got that, but LL Cool J is our little Richard. Yeah. yeah. Meaning that he one guy. He was the first one guy that blew everybody's minds away. First was Curtis Blow was our first star, 
But our first superstar, they even made Michael Jackson and Prince turn their heads to LL Cool J. But that argument is not made by people who are strong in the detail of history and can't make comparisons. Like, why is Rod Stewart in there? So you got a journalist and you got a, a body of people who will be able to say, well, yeah, he's in it for small faces or he's in it for Rod Stewart, because they know that, but they don't know LL Cool J's history. So you know this, but you don't know that. And that's kind of affecting the, 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 you know, the trajectory of the knowledge of rap music and hip hop. And that could be also because of youth or also because of ignorance. Yes, and maybe both. funding, maybe it, marketing. It's has politics, too. Oh, yeah, everything's politics. I have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. So, typically, in the content of lyrics, and, and I know there's Salt and Pepper, and, you know, I'd like to know who your favorite female rappers are, but typically there is a kind of objectification of women in mm. lyrics. Right. And, you know, in the same way we're fighting for unity and a lack of divisiveness between whites and blacks, you know, why why are women across the board looked at as bitches and hoes? And why are we not given the same stature? I was reading a statistic the other day that said that gender equality on the rate that's going won't even won't even be close by twenty thirty. Hmm. It's interesting. That's we awesome. did elect a black man, but not a woman. You know, there's no woman, but you know, we did elect a black man. Well, I would just show you something, doesn't it? Testosterone is atomic. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing I can say there. Yeah. Testosterone is atomic. That's a title. <laughs> I mean I did the song on celebration of ignorance called Cave Manic. I wanted to bring that up and you were bringing up all those references of Records, Cave Manic sounds like Donovan influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, that yeah, psych- right. psychedelic it, it, 60s. Yes. I, I love Cave Manic. It's ayahuasca. No, <laughs> but I'm just saying that it's like, yeah, that's what the period I come from. And Cave Manic talks about, you know, males, we, we have to reduce the testosterone in ourselves to make this equal and... and and it, it ain't gonna happen anytime soon as more as people keep beating their chest thinking that, you know, a man gotta run this, a man gotta run that. So it's reflected even down to the lyrics of artists and the posturing that goes on and the posturing that goes on in politics and and it's always gotta be these dudes that's gonna why does politics got like ninety five percent males anyway? I mean, so there's a lot of work to be done. So Hip hop and rap lyrics with, I would say, a large majority of males mm-hmm. who are trying to like grow their way out of frustration, trying to go through the wilderness of the world and try to figure out how their maleness can actually make them survive or whatever instead of live. You're going to have the side effects come out all through the words on every paper, song, or whatever. I would tell you this, though. In Rap Station, uh, our 10 station channel in the network, we have an all radio station called She Radio. And it's all women, all the time, 24 hours a day. Producers, DJs, songwriters, artists, um, 30 years worth of women in hip-hop. And... On She Radio, you know, it, it, it clearly points to example that when we talk about women in hip hop outside the United States of America, it's like 40, sometimes 50 percent of the music. This is a USA type of thing where women in music is looked upon as being also random and not good enough. And it's really heavily reflected in hip hop mm. in this country and also endorsed and co-signed by the structures that that kind of, you know, boost these figures up as being, okay, we're going to, you're doing rap, you're a woman, so we're going to kind of like have one of y'all or another two battle at the time. I mean, years ago, in the 80s, it was like, okay, we got MC Light, we got MC uh, and, and Latifah, but even in the 80s, you had women groups, you had women producers, they had their own thing going on. When the majors came in, they start picking real one male MC, less groups, 
and the one male MC is what they felt that they could market and get behind. They need that rough, tough type of thing. And the women were forsaken and abandoned. And also the more clammy the ad atmosphere got, they also migrated to other forms of music. And, you know, women said, I could, I could deal with that, you know, boxing with all that type of attitude when I'm in high school or maybe early years of college. But when I'm 27 to 28, I don't want to hear that bitch shit, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's real. And, 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 and the thing about it is that the rest of the women around the world and producing, songwriting, spitting, as we say, on the, as MCs, mm -hmm. yo, they deal straight up and down how they feel, and the records are dope. And that's why we felt that it could be one of the station channels and it does well. All the time you hear women's contributions, and, and also what comes out of there goes into our regular internet works as well. How can we find She Radio? You go, we got the app on Apple and Google, and you get all the stations, and um, and go to rap station. That's great. It would be great to have a, a, a school to help teenage girls be able to get empowered to rap. Yeah, you know the thing is, is, is I think the the bigger conversation is is like we want to make sure that the arts can can set you free and replenish you, and and we got to separate the arts being able to grant you money, <laughs> riches, and fame, and all these endowments yeah. into, like, feeding your soul. But first, you got to recognize your soul before you know that you need a feeding of your soul. So how do the arts get sold to the people? It doesn't get sold. It has to be granted and given away. But once again, you got to explain what they're getting and how that nourishment helps. Yes, and it could be like asparagus to a fifth grader. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you got to figure, yo, you need this. Yeah, and mm -hmm. in our culture, we see them turning, becoming famous in music into a game show, like American Idol, where it's like winning the lottery or winning a sport. And not, yeah. not about developing artistry, it's, which is obviously what you guys have done. It's the worst thing, I think. It's, it's like game show, lottery, because you can sing this, now we're gonna, you're going to be... You're going to get this one record deal under this dude. It's just... And what is that record deal? Yeah, and I'm just like, it just reeks of... It reeks of, you know, like, it's, it's circus zoo, you know, type stuff. It's like, yeah. come on, man. It's like... Spectacle. It's, it's a spectacle. And it's yeah. the difference between being spectacle and spectacular. <laughs> right. So, you know, spectacle is going to get you for a moment and grab everybody in to consume what you do. Spectacular is going to make you go the long route and be revered like, um, you know, like Hamilton, mm -hmm. you know, or the Carole King play. It's like, you know, you're going to go in there and you're going to come out nourished. You will see it again. Yeah. That's, or, that's the big key. You will see it again. And once you're looking at brilliance such as a play where you have to get muscle memory, get the lines down, get the songs down, musicals, are, musicals you could teach a lot just with musicals. Hmm. But they, as we move it forward in the 21st century, they're looked upon as being, eh, that was something in the last century. But they did a lot to people, and they did a lot for artistry. Yeah, good ones are still pretty, you know, Hamilton people got really excited about that. Huh? I was blown away, man. I was invited by Lynn, and um, and I had a, one of the great times watching mm -hmm. this play in motion, and just an amazement of each one of the actors and actresses who were doing their thing. Like clockwork on a stage, you gotta admire that. Yeah, he's great. I mean, he has the the energy of hip hop a lot, but with the content and the artistry. And one thing you've always stressed is, to be a good writer, you have to develop artistry. It's not something that comes immediately. I mean, you have no, to yeah, you got you. Also, I think that the important thing is that you have to allow yourself to be taught by great teachers. I mean. Yeah, there are a few accidents, man. <laughs> yeah. I think talent is a fantastic thing that everybody got. But to manifest it into a skill, a skill works when you sleep. You know, yeah. talent is something that, you know, you got to learn how to manifest it into a skill, sharpen it. And that's so it could do well for you, so it could do great for others, too. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. You seem to get a pretty good uh, grasp on how to write a good song early on. Um, I, I have something that works for me. It's called Right From The Title. 
Yeah, I noticed it, which is kind of a songwriter thing that people, songwriters have done for a long time. I was, I thought it was interesting you did that as well. It's a little tin pan out. out yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, a little brill build, building. Working backwards? Yeah, working backwards. Yeah. Because my thing is like this is, we have a conversation. We don't fly into a conversation and I'm telling you, oh, yeah, by the way, Forrest Tucker was an F troop. You're like, what yeah. the hell? You have, a, you have an attention. <laughs> I don't see what I'm saying. It's like, remember you, just Tucker. you just can't come out left field with like, like a topic that it's like, what the hell? So you come like, hey, um, what do you think about? And you start your conversation with, with a topic and yeah. you start building into the topic and you branch out from there. Yeah. Well, that's the same thing I feel about a title. Yeah. Branch out from the top. Now, of course, you might get an urge and you get this this thing where there's no words. There are no words for, for all of our emotions. Mm -hmm. But as a songwriter, you better find some. Yeah. Yeah. Know? And then and don't and don't brush don't don't brush your chest like you're doing all so much of a big deal. I'm, I'm you know I'm always humbled by what I'm not. <laughs> you know because okay I I wrote what I felt was a pretty solid song. All right, now write it in Spanish. Mm. <laughs> you know, perform that song in in French or perform it in Arabic in front of you know, and and in, in Dubai or somewhere like that. Have you had to do that? Have you no? Nah, one of my biggest regrets in, in my whole life and in my professional career is that I don't know another language. And uh, you know, as much as they come up and tell me about Rosetta Stone, I just. I don't have that com compartment in myself that has opened myself up to to, to that skill set. We've well, been busy with a lot of other things. I think that's part. I of I think it. the brain only got so much, man. Absolutely. And, and, you know. But you know, I thought it was really interesting. A lot of songwriters from from that generation, sixties and seventies, were writing songs that kind of came to them. They weren't planning out the song. This is what I'm going to write about. And you said that's not really what you do. You want to know what the song is about before you're going in, or you said it's a waste of your time to just wait for it to come. My time is always different. It's compartmentalized into a bunch of different things. I, you know, I don't have other the things that I do. Like I don't smoke and I don't drink, so I don't, I don't have that drink that takes me to another place. I mean, my smoking, my drinking, my songs, or, or, or the closest thing is probably getting on a road and driving. <laughs> you know. And just driving for miles, and and, and my my cars, you know, the pen and, and the pads, the road, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm always I'm in a mood like that, and that's where songs might pop up, or somebody says something. Look out, you know, yeah. don't say anything clever around a song. Right, just the, the listening, and you're always listening to people. Yeah, yeah and that's yeah. where the titles come from. And not oh. listening just so I can get a song either, because if a <laughs> song don't come, it just don't come. Right, you know? so, yeah. so I don't force it. And, I, and I'm in a, another band, Prophets of Rage, so a lot of times, you know, when we're writing songs, we have six great songwriters there. So I'm stepping to the side and, and seeing what forms. It's a little different process for me writing so Prophets of Rage songs um, because I'm writing with co-writers going at trying to make something from scratch. I'm a title guy, and um, it, it's a different process. When I write for myself or Public Enemy, it's always title, hit the subject, nail it, get the hell on out. And what leads you to a, a title? What makes a title good that you, you decide to use? Uh, history is great. And I, I'm always doing a, a historical play of words. Or I might take a title from a song of the past, like Fight the Power, and just do it my way. That was from so, a different song? I didn't know that. Oh yeah, Fight the Power was 1975 by the Osley Brothers. Ah. And it was influential as a kid, you know, 15-year-old, when Fight the Power was a big, you know, record in the hood in the community mm. and said a lot of things so when Spike Lee needed a, a anthem and a theme 14 years later for Do the Right Thing that was the only thing that stuck in my head ah. you know, fight the power as the words not so much the songs but then I wrote it while on tour and you wrote that for him he asked for it I thought you yeah. had the song already no no that was, that was specifically oh. written for Do the Right Thing the movie Spike said, I need the anthem, guys. That was the anthem. Oh, yeah. It worked great in that movie. It was well, so well, powerful. You, well, then again, you can't you can't brush stroke your chest and like, oh, me, you old big me. Um, he put this song in a movie 15 times. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like... It opens the film. The equivalent of a radio DJ playing something 15 times. So that was the epitome of our radio play, our movie play. And, our, and Public Enemy songs had to find other ways other than being heard on the radio. Later on... Hip hop and rap music helped people like Ludacris and 
Jay Z and people like that, where you hear their songs like all day on the radio. It wasn't like that when we started. Mm. Yeah. It must have changed everything when it was in that movie for, for the band, or, or did it not? It, 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 it took it to a different level because we, we, we wasn't going to be heard by, I mean, we wasn't going to be heard by the United States of America audiences like we was on that movie. We set our we set our pad our directions in '87 to go around the rest of the world. That was the plan. The plan was to do like like Hendrix, go somewhere else, become big somewhere else, sweep back in the states on our own merit, and that's what happened. So Public Enemy came into the United States after being accepted by the UK, which is our base, and we came in the United States in '88. We started in the United States in 87, but went around the world, came back, like, oh, boom, okay. It's like Hendrix, you know? Yeah. And I saw the when you first draft for Fight the Power that you wrote by hand. Oh, is, yeah. Is yeah. that how you always write? You write the lyrics by hand? Uh, yeah. Yeah, by, by hand. And then later on when I got computer literate, then I was writing by hand and then putting it into my laptop. I go right on my Apple laptop go in there and try to read what I wrote and I've done a lot of my writing while driving. My first album I wrote while the pad was in the passenger seat, oh. the cassette was in the deck, my left hand on the steering wheel, my right hand on my pad, my eyes always looking at the road and afterwards trying to look, what the hell did I write? <laughs> did you read it? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it took some time. I'm, I'm, you know, I come from a draftsman background in architecture, so it's not going to be totally a mess. But so you're saying the cassette, you were always writing to the music, you're writing to a track when you were in the car working uh, for on our songs? first album, yeah, yeah. And it necessarily isn't a finished project, but product, but it could be something where you know you're rapping, you got a metronome, your, your tempo, and there's a certain feeling with notes that will take you, take you to certain places. Yeah, I was curious what your process is like. You said at one point that you don't write a lot that you cut out, that you do go and call, you know, from what you write. Right, right. But mm -hmm. are you generally writing to a track, and is that how it works? You're writing to a track, you're writing to, to something in your head, you're writing to a song that you might hear. Like, I, I might hear a song by Louise's mom and dad, and I'll be like, okay, boom, I'll take it here, mm. you know. A lot of guys are like that, too, you know, like Poss and um, Pasta News and... and um, Dave from De La Soul and Maceo. De La Soul is like one of the great songwriters, performers, artists of our time. Just They're just wonderful. And I just came off tour with them. Yeah, you're touring with a few people. Yeah, yeah. De La Soul, um, also Wu-Tang Clan, and, um, and also um, DJ Premier. Mm -hmm. And that is just a wonderful, you know, reunion party for us the last couple of weeks. Are you all on stage at the same time? Or are you playing different slots? Different slots. And yeah. at the end of the day, we're all, you know, for now. Oh. We played our last show in Helsinki. Now Wu-Tang is around the United States. I think Daylight might be doing some things in the United States with them. But um, I get ready to go with Profits of Rage in August. And, and you've you've appeared on a lot of people's records. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a hip-hop thing now. I actually did that in the beginning where it was rare. Because record companies didn't want you to cross uh, collaborate with other labels and other artists, and I had to break that one up. Myself, Ice Cube, and Big Daddy Kane really became the first significant intro record label make it happen record on Burn Hollywood Burn on Fear of Black Planet with Public Enemy, and um, Ice Cube was with Priority, which was independent at the time. Big Daddy Kane was with Warner Brothers. And we were with Sony. So they were telling us that we couldn't collaborate. And I'm like, well, that's BS. Make this shit happen, man. <laughs> you know, and, it, and with wrangling, they did, they did, and they realized that it was beneficial for everybody. They built everybody's quote unquote brand up to be marketed. But now it's like, that's a, a, almost like a no brainer for artists to collaborate. Yeah, we're yeah. listening to your uh, song with Logic on the way here. Yeah, yeah, that, that actually came through where he was interested and my manager had the contact. And, and America, you know, that's the name of that one. Yeah, yeah, America. And go in and I was happy to be a, um, asked to be selected on that. When you do those, you're, you're writing your own part usually. They want yeah. you to come but to, to bring your words. They want me to bring my own words, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not opposed to going and doing somebody else's writing. I think the first time I did that, 
um, an artist and a producer named Paris did a Public Enemy album in 2006. And um, Rebirth of a Nation was the name of the album. And, he, you know, Paris is like Prince. He was in there just like making every, he put an album together with pieces. Hmm. Like, I don't even remember doing like an entire verse straight out. He kind of, he did the, he just one of the most miraculous production jobs I've ever seen. Amazing. So have you done something with exchanging files online, some kind of collective songwriting where people... Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think we were the first to actually do that. In 2001, David Snyder, C-Doc, actually was part of a, um, a contingent called The Impossibles. Mm -hmm. And 2001... These are people who were in different parts of the country. And David had, you know, his main studio. C Doc had his main studio. It was from Pittsburgh. And what everybody did, they, they recorded their verses and then they emailed it to C Doc. And that's how the impossibles were. Um, spelled I M P O S S E B U L L S. And um, they were the world's first virtual rap group. And that's where the process started. And he would put together these verses from people who never see each other. And they also got to know each other through the first internet website for um, for hip-hop and rap. It was really the second after the Beastie Boys. It was publicenemy.com. And everybody convened and met each other through the enemy board, which was a, you know, a message board. And uh, that's how everybody got to know, know each other and how they met each other, even though they were in different parts of the world. And to this to this day, the public enemy message board, it's it's been defunct for ten years, but everybody still knows each other from around the world. Mm -hmm. So the Impossibles got their beginning, and we had lost a member at the beginning of the year. Um, great guy by the name of Marcus J. Um, Anthony, and he was one of the great uh, songwriters. We lost him at the beginning of the year, and uh, he's from Ohio. And so we say the impossibles forever because um, we all met virtually. Mm. Mm. You know, I want to ask you about your process more about when, when you're writing, are you rapping to it? Is that where the, the songs come from? Are you just thinking in terms of words and writing? Um, I'm rapping to it in, in mumbles. <laughs> just they ain't going to come out as a mumble. <laughs> they could come out, cause, you know, you hear something and you're like, da, 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 and it's all. I think I was one of the first MCs to come along with different flows you know, to whatever would be a standard beat. And it would be a lot of them, un, you know, really unorthodox flows hmm. and kind of like in triplets. And I didn't know what I was doing. I'm just going on feel. Mm -hmm. But that's how it ends up being written. That's how it ends up being heard um, when it comes out to that particular thing. Later on, people like Andre 3000 from Outkast and um, people become very staccato with different flows to signify how to make a regular beat stand out. Hmm. The, the the first ones to really seriously make the music go to them were Karis One and um, Rakim. They made the music go to them instead of them going to the music. And that's very important because that, after after that you could dictate the flows and take it wherever you want. That's how how you do it, yeah. In a crude way, uh, I think the thing that I have more going for me than flow is voice. Yeah, yeah, your I voice is this, great and it's resonant, voice. and you can hear the words. You really project in a powerful way. Yeah, well, a lot of times people find out when you can do it, and it when you have to do it live, that's the challenge. And when you do it in a big place, you got to pick up depth perception. Like if you're doing a big festival, and you're doing a gigantic arena, you you better get that diaphragm working and you got to project, you got to blow. Yeah. Is it just a microphone or are you using things to augment it's just voice and mic and, and your front of house? Yeah, and I'm I'm known as yeah. a high and long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that's, 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 like I said, there's a couple of areas that I know that I have voice and, and power. And I know those are God-given, but, you know... If you don't have rap music and hip hop as recording music, then what are you good? What is voice and power good for? A, right. fo a foreman. Acting? Well, a foreman. <laughs> Sports uh, get that bell and bring it down here. You know, <laughs> a drill sergeant. 
Yeah. And, but you, like you said, acting. You have to project yeah. and acting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you did the the Clash story. Yeah. Your voice is... It's lovely to listen to. And I sure enough got worked over the coals on that one. Oh, really? Uh, about a month. Yeah. And, and and really, seriously, I had 536 pages, but really times four, because I had to do it four different ways, and we had, um, you know, the BBC and Spotify, and they had their teams, and, you know, had a, a, a very instructional, great person. And they just coached me through. Go and tackle and knock it out. Jennifer Ford was my coach inside the booth, and she worked the coals over me and made that coal turn into a diamond. Yeah. It sounds beautiful. Yeah, well, and, uh, Jennifer gets half the credit and the rest of the team. And I love that you celebrate the Clash, because like you've done, it's all about content. I mean, I learned so much from Clash songs, you know? Like, yeah. Denise, I learned a lot. They had... Content that no one got near in songs before then, really. Bill Stephanie, who's the, the, the key for the beginnings of Public Enemy with Def Jam, he was key to make that happen. And Bill Stephanie also, you know, as a fellow student at Adelphi University, was into the areas of radio promoting the clash at WLIR back in Long Island back in the day. And he saw the comparison between the clash and Public Enemy, and he said, you guys could be like the clash of hip-hop. And mm -hmm. he saw that, and that's what happened. I, I and, and, we that. used the, and we used much of the same record company people, too, because the clash came into the Columbia system in 77. We came into the Columbia system in 87. Mm. And so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, rap was our punk, because we didn't pay attention to punk. We had our own <laughs> problems. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you about that. When, when you first heard rap, did it... Did, I mean, when was that? When did you first hear it? Was it on regular radio? How did you no, hear no, it? No, was, no. It, before it was recorded work, it was it was just in the atmosphere. Mm. I'm from Long Island, so everybody in Long Island either came from one of the boroughs, except for Staten. And they <laughs> migrated out there, and um, they brought all those things that had happened in the city a week later. And so rap was heard on, you know, parties. It was a live thing. And when people recorded it from parties, you heard the tapes. Because at the same time... The cassette tapes were were the format. You start buying a little bit of the cassette players, and you had the cassette tapes, and you could record and still play your albums of music. Yeah, you know, and so, and this is one thing when people talk about technology, it gives it and it takes away. Mm -hmm. It gave in the middle of the '70s because it was an alternative to having all your music kind of cheap without going. And knowing that you had to buy every LP, mm -hmm. you had to buy every twelve inch. Yeah, that was the get start. The play. Like that, that was the early, music. Yeah, that was the <laughs> eighties. That was the early seventies and the late sixties <clears throat> where you did all that. Mm -hmm. But in the mid seventies, man, when they come out with the little, you know, radios with the cassettes, that opened up a whole new world. And then you could buy the cassettes. Remember the TDKs? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Long Island had the TDK company, the the the, the factory right across the Roosevelt Field. So it was right there. So that was cassettes. So all the music was there on cassettes, but that were not they weren't records. The records didn't happen until seventy nine. Matter of fact, I thought it was inconceivable that rap could be put on a record because it was a three hour thing. It was a party thing. It was a you know, it was for the course you go to an event and people were rapping on the mic, but it was like throughout the course of the it would keep going hours. from one rapper to uh, another. Yeah, like you know, maybe one guy would have it and the DJ would take over. It was a big event thing. It wasn't, you know, wasn't something that was reduced to three minutes. minute pop song. Yeah. 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 But I'll tell you, the irony is that the first time what blew my mind is Rap is the Light, which is officially the first rap record, officially. It wasn't how long this 15 minute record was, it was how short they truncated it. Yeah. I was thinking about, man, because you're thinking the other way around. They took three hours and made it 15 minutes, as opposed to like, whoa, this is a 15-minute long marathon song. <laughs> no, they, they took what happens in three hours and made it 15 minutes. So just that way of looking at rap music and hip-hop showed you the difference. Mm -hmm. So when you started rapping at parties, were, were you good at it right away, or did it take you a while? I had a voice that would make a cheap radio shack system seem like it was uh, pristine. <laughs> <laughs> that was the difference because most systems were cheap. Um, somebody had, if they had a regular middle of the line voice, they would kind of have their frequencies mixed up in the record. 
and I was heard over the record. I was clear. I was powerful. And I usually did it in college to sit down whack rappers mm -hmm. that try to mess up dances with fine girls. Ah, that was the, the original <laughs> Well, I'm dancing on the floor with somebody, you know, and, and then all of a sudden she don't want to dance because somebody's on the microphone just making it terrible. Mm -hmm. So I would get on the microphone to get people away from the microphone. Uh -huh. One, you know, you're like one of the quote unquote pretty boys who know how to do the hustle and all that. <laughs> so it's like, you know, all right, okay, you like to dance. You, she says yes or no. If she says yes, okay, boom. Then you, this is like 77, 78 now. Mm -hmm. So you're dancing and all that, and you want the DJ and the music to be right. Because sure. the minute it's wrong, she look at you like, I don't want to be on the floor no more. It's like, oh, dude. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there, there's a song in that. Yeah. There, that's a whole. Th yeah. I have a question about the cassettes because I've seen cassettes for sale, uh -huh. and merch. Now, where are they going to play it? We don't care about that. We just we <laughs> care about pretending that this is a year that probably used to exist or don't exist or won't exist okay, again. So it's a thing. You see that? Cause I bought that there cassette there. Yeah. From the local record store, and it was like for sale for like seventy nine dollars. So I well, I mean, so you know, it's collectors. Sure. You know? so when, when you started rapping, and then, you know, there's a lot of Walkmen still around. Yeah. There's all kinds I still of got stuff. Mine. A lot of players. Used to carry them around. Now. Look, well, when when we were growing up, we didn't have eBay. <laughs> <laughs> so and now manufacturers are popping up making cassette players again. Yeah, people want them. They'll sell a, them. I think I think there's a business for everything and everybody, but I think as far as this overkill industry thing, there might not be that. Right. It's like we got this overkill industry thing where we make one unit and we're making 600 million of them. I think that those days are gone and everybody's all over the place with a whole bunch of different apparatus and gadgets. And um, digital does a lot for a lot of people, which makes all these things also ran specialty items, collector items. Sure. Well, you became great with rhymes. You're a great rhymer. And that, mm -hmm. that's one thing that really distinguished rap and hip-hop, too, the use of rhymes. Mm -hmm. Like, her father was famous for the inner rhymes that you get. In, but you oh, guys yeah. always have inner rhymes. There's like in every line, there's, yeah, right, in every yeah. line, there's sometimes rhymes with the same <laughs> word. And uh, did well, that come easily to you, or is that something you had to develop? Well, just to give you the similarity of two different times of being from Queens, and <laughs> same thing as Jerry Goffin, and also... Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Put right? Don't the same sentence, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but also Joseph Simmons and Russell Simmons. Right. But um, the rhymes come from the songs that you hear. That that, that it, it, you know, as a as a kid, that's what you know, kind of like ties you into the story. Nursery rhymes, Doctor Seuss, and then you listen to Saul, and the song always had some kind of rhyme in it and it was just a, it locks you in it locks mm -hmm. your muscle memory in and um, the words are always there so listening to the songs of the 60s they didn't play around they did not play around there's two minutes and 30 seconds to get into your head yeah but and, often your rhymes are more energetic where there's many rhymes in, in, um, in very lines it's like an energy with rhymes that you, you accumulate well it makes up for the lack of melody and harmony Harmony and melody will stretch you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have well, I, this. It's harmonic and, it, and it's melodic in there, mm -hmm. but you don't you don't lean on it as taking you to the next area of song, you know. On the notes, the notes will take you in, and so right now in in, in twenty nineteen, the musics are all understood where you can borrow from a lot of different techniques from past, present, and also the future to create something that's going to get you to the next verse or the closeout. Mm -hmm. But then again, we also look at music differently. Like what, uh, I don't believe everything needs to be structural like that. We could get jazz timing. Um, we could be like, okay, this song's going to have one verse. Mm -hmm. I think what leads to the burnout of people is knowing that, not necessarily the sounds, but it could be just be in length. Yeah. Like I'm tired of hearing, you know, Three minute, forty two second records. No matter what sounds it, it has, so the rhymes actually, and the and the, the just the juxtaposition of rhymes, music, story, idea, and then also you got all these other things that came in during the eighties and nineties. Just like, okay, the visual idea, 
I, futuristically speaking, I feel that if a person is a songwriter right now and then and they're their own artist, I say, hey, you know, if you got to figure it out how to write, make your own music, go to your, you know, from everywhere, from GarageBand, which I think is incredible, un underused. <laughs> A garage band is underused, and then of course they want to go in their Pro Tools and all that other stuff. Um, great. You say also learn how to shoot with your phone too, because everything now is through the phone. So you shoot, you learn how to edit well, and if you have a three minute song, you don't have to shoot a three minute video. Now you could shoot. Think as an editor, you have a three minute song, shoot a one minute video. You get it all out visually in one minute. The other thing that I love about your records is you're always in the groove. Some some rappers, it's almost frenetic, and you don't feel that. But you're right in the pocket the way you, you rap, and it feels I good. I no? don't think so. Hmm. I don't care. I think that producers will also might keep you in the pocket, but I don't think so. I think there's a lot of people who were born in the pocket. I think I come from another time where it's meant to be in the pocket, but I think... At this point right now, it's just like um, doing something different. And and But then I never cared about what somebody thought of it either. I said, if I'm walking away and I know it's right, then I know it's right. I'm not making records for, for fanatics only. I'm making half of it if I feel good about it or I want to do it. I mean, I came into this business because Rick Rubin asked me to do it for two years. So that's a different thing of like, oh, I want to be a songwriter. I want to be a rap artist. So I was... Asked for two years. For two years before you said yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah? I wanted to be, we wanted to do hip-hop radio. I wanted to be a broadcaster. Hmm. I didn't want to do records. I thought records was beneath that. Wow. And we were kept out of doing the broadcasting. And so records were always available. I never thought records was that big a deal to do because I had to categorize three rooms of records. So I'm like, I got three rooms of records. So is a record a big deal? Yes, the best records out of here are a big deal, but as far as every other record just here, it takes work. I'd rather be a broadcaster. I'd rather be a jock. I'd rather be one of those dudes, uh, or Frankie Crocker. I'd rather be those guys that bring the record in. And that's my love, and that's what I end up doing even to this day. I like breaking records. I like ushering them in. I like breaking new artists. I like doing all those things that help the art form out. I like being in the background. I'm a behind the scenes guy. Yes, I've been in the front of the scenes, and but the, I'm a behind the scene guy. I like to work with songwriters. I like to make their songs sharp, not necessarily stronger, because some songs could afford to be weaker. You know what I'm saying? They could fit, you know, they could be liquid enough to fit into these areas that need some pliability to, for them to go into. They don't necessarily have to be at its best, hmm. but they should know the difference, you know? It, they shouldn't also take easy way and lazy ways out. You know, it should be worked through to its thorough form, maybe not its strongest, maybe not its best, you know? Hitting that note hard doesn't necessarily, it's, that's the bet, best note at that time. It means that you hit that note and it might have been subtle. Same thing with the recording process. Same thing in the mastering process. Same thing in the... Everything doesn't have to be, you know, testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's a, good, that's a good message and a good thing. Yeah. Good thing to remember. So, I, so I've learned. I've learned, you know. And I know every time you do these interviews, I know you got to go through the the whipped cream of people praising your family for <laughs> for giving them the the, That's good the, the ability. Yeah, I, I don't mind. Yeah, no. and a lot of times, like, um, yeah, it's like both your mom and your dad, you know, meant everything to to us as forget song. I never knew I was gonna write songs or be in a song. I was like, I know just as growing up, I'm a, I, where my radio was. That was important. The life, the life aspect mm -hmm. was it. Not like, oh, I'm gonna grow up to be like them songwriters. And no, nah, it's no nah, the songs are like aunts and uncles, mm -hmm. you know. And 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 these times could use a little bit of that because that 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 closed the generation gaps. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That we could all share the same songs in the house. There's songs today you can't share with kids. I got an eight year old. 
<laughs> can't share. Can't, no, can't share. I know. Songs. There's certain things he heard. Us. Yeah. He didn't always hear them correctly, too. Which was well, yeah, and, they, and, and you really can't even turn on Netflix. Yeah. You, you can't. There's a lot that you can't expose eight year olds to. Eight, as, as, as kids growing up in the 60s, one car ride, you could hear the same music. Mm-hmm. Right. One car ride. Yeah. My kids, my oldest kids in the 90s, they were forced to listen to the Four Tops and AM radio from the 60s and 70s. You know, they were forced because y'all ain't got no other way. I mean, yeah, they could have their Walkman, but I wouldn't allow them. So they had to listen to what I listened to. So as older 26 and 31-year-olds, they're like, wow, I can't. They make me tapes. I mean, I'm not here to go with tapes. They make me music, you know, that's from what I showed them and what I played in the car. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Now, my youngest, it's a battle because I listen to Sirius, and she'll listen to some of those songs. And she likes some of those songs, but there's so much kids' music coming out now trying to sell the kid. I'm trying to, like, okay, your playlist is all right, but I cannot listen to a day of your playlist. <laughs> I, I am so with you on that. But, yeah, sometimes I have to turn it off. Sometimes I say, I can't. <laughs> I am sorry. And, it's, and someone asked me yesterday, he said, uh, you know, as a parent, do you feel that it's appropriate to tell your kids no, you can't listen to that or you can't write lyrics like that. You need to work absolutely. It's like you clean up after yourself. You mm-hmm. have respect for people and you don't write shit lyrics. Like, those are the <laughs> rules of the house. Yo, I mean, that's <laughs> the best it's your thing. family there. Yeah, I said, yo, that's a, like, I, I could take that and crystallize that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, you know, from the Gotham King, you know, family book, don't write, don't write whack shit. <laughs> yeah, mean something. Yeah. You know? And listen to what came before you. That's the thing that most offends me is not caring. You got to check this out. Check out the original Footsteps in the Dark, not right. the record with the sample. Listen to the Isley Brothers. Check right. this out. Listen for milliseconds and then don't want to hear it. I want to listen to my version of this song. This, was, this is where the DJs in hip hop really seriously persevered. And they led the gamut because they would be archivists and they would uphold the versions. And a lot of, there'd be a lot of times they'll to tell you, like, yo, man, I, I, I can't honor that, that new version, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they would be like, they would, no, I can't honor that new version. We That's take important. That old beat. We've got to take that, that chess records version, man, with that little hissy scratch in it. Or, you know? Yeah. And the DJs, but see, the DJs have been phased out. Now, of course, they're back, but a lot of the DJs went off and ventured in other areas where they, they have the autonomy, like EDM and stuff right. like that. Or college radio. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. So. You know, it's interesting, just to wrap it up, that you, you celebrate the, the music of the 60s and 70s so much. You, are you optimistic in the future? We've got good music coming up. You think music, good music will keep coming? Of course. Yeah. Because good music keep coming is your, based on your discovery. Mm-hmm. To me, 1957 is brand new. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So, look, it's all out there. Mm -hmm. The only thing that changes is people, new people are born and older people die. The music is still there. So discovery is is the present and the gift of the moment. What are you discovering? That's based on curation. Mm -hmm. That's based on curation. If we're looking at The Lion King in a play, and the Lion King's been running since the 80s. You're looking at something that's had started off with different actors and actresses and now moved on into another century with actors and actresses coming in and other ones leaving. The song, you know, remains the same. Hmm. And I think the song is something that has to be saluted and then and not looked upon the lazy way out. You know, you got to look on, look at a song and come in there with a bucket of integrity to try to be able to address it. So that's 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 the the song, you know, moves forward, man. Mm. And you got to you know you got to march to that drum beat, and that's to me is always important about future the future music because now the accessibility to so many young people is there. Mm-hmm. I love YouTube. Let me tell you why I love YouTube. It's not necessarily just from the songs, which is overstood. 
but I'm watching a lot of movies from the 50s that you get kind of like for nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, I'm watching films from the 50s. I'm not, I, don't, I don't even watch a lot of movies, but I'm watching a lot of film noir from 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. I'm just watching, just, I'm just entranced by it. So that's discovery to me. That's like, it's brand new to me. I'm mm -hmm. like, whoa. Mm -hmm. So discovery is the artistry of the future, mm. where it wasn't the artistry of the past because we didn't have the accessibility. Now there's no excuse for not having when it's there. Now it's the discovery, and you gotta, you gotta be taught also about it to discover it, and you gotta be taught about it when you do discover it. Mm -hmm. So curation, I think, is the key to future music and future artists. And listening, Beautiful. as you said, listening is the key. Yeah. Well, you gotta listen to your teachers. Listen to this episode with <laughs> Chuck D here. That's great. Thank you so much. You are tuned into the Great Song Adventure. 